whilst I was on holiday with my family with my wife and son at my parents home a letter came in to address to my stepfather with a little booklet which had been roughly stapled together it was a type script which had been poorly photocopied <coughs> with a letter from a friend saying I've received this and I think it's very interesting but I'm not too sure what to make of it would you please read it and tell me what you think so I said to him well you've got plenty of time to read this and it looks interesting so can I borrow it and went away and read it and what it was was the German translation which is unpublished of this book of which I brought copies Living Water by Olaf Alexanderson now have some of you don't know this book yes so I'll say a bit about it because this was the first experience which was really quite an extraordinary experience I, I sort of literally plunged into this book and I was totally fascinated it's basically the biography of a man called Victor Schauberger who was born in Austria which then was a much bigger place and also contained vast tracts still of primeval forest the great impenetrable forest that the legions the Roman legions had found it so hard to get through wild and completely still in its original state and he was a forester and although his family wanted him to study and become some, something else he wanted to live in the forest as his ancestors had done and this is what he did but he had a particularly special affinity to the life in it and what's more there was also a particular tradition of in very interesting and remarkable knowledges especially to do with the life giving functions of water with the special properties of the water that still at that time used to flow down in an incredibly vivifying way one of the first observations that, uh, that he made which are described in this book was that there was a spring on a hillside which had never failed it was enclosed in a little stone building which one day for some reason got taken down and then to everybody's utter amazement the spring failed and again for some reason somebody had the thought of putting the stone structure back up and not long thereafter the spring started, the spring started to flow again now it's interesting that Victor Schauberger started to think why should that be and started to connect this coolness and the darkness the peace, the calm that was that the water enjoyed under this building and to associate that with how water normally behaves I mean we would normally say water brings forth plants but then he said but why isn't it interesting that wherever water flows it brings forth this cover you know the trees and the bushes that grow up and keep everything cool in the shade away from the sunlight in a kind of peaceful surrounding uh, he made other observations one question that really uh, interested him was uh, how do fish like for instance trout stand in a torrent in the middle of a torrent stock still hardly occasionally moving a fin how did they do it? I mean really they, they should be swept down or they should have to work extremely hard just to stay in one spot but they don't you know there they are totally mobile just the occasional movement of the fin how? so with this clue about the, the water has a vivifying property that's associated with coolness and with a state of um, intensity somehow that is uh, when it's away from sunlight and dispersion he had some friends pour some boiling water into the stream some a uh, few hundred feet up from where a fish like that stood uh, and when the by now totally dilute water warm water reached the fish 
it was immediately swept down, completely lost its position and just couldn't stay and then had laboriously to swim back up to its former position, settle down and then could c carry on this was very interesting so from this and many other similar observations he concluded that there must be some property some power, some force or energy associated with truly living water that was, also, that was particularly strong if water was cool and if water was warmed up or in some way subjected to unnatural treatment then uh, this property got lost as you could observe the fish no longer could make use of it in whatever way it did to stay where it did there were other things that were funny there were special kinds of mosses that used to grow upstream rather than hang downstream and again he thought there must be something about this vivifying force and that, that holds them in this way and he began to realize that well water as we all know in fact is, is a, an extraordinary substance one of its uh, remarkable properties is that like all things it condenses and it cools but it reaches the state of maximum density at 4 degrees centigrade and if you cool it further then again it expands unlike almost every other substance there is uh, and that is a very important property without which in fact life would not be possible for one thing ice would not float and therefore the polar ice cap the north would not float and all sorts of uh, other things would follow from that if water did not behave in this way but what he arrived at was that water had its state of maximum vivification at the state of 4 degrees centigrade and he also began to associate that with the special movements the eddies and curls and swirls and uh, currents within water and a particular kind of movement that one can observe uh, that water has traced around certain rocks which it has carved into an egg shape a particular form which uh, if you like embodies the truly natural flow of fully healthy living water and he built up such a science of this uh, that when the test came he came up with remarkable results what happened was that his employer who was uh, a great landowning prince had uh, a young wife who liked to spend a lot of money and when once again the, the season at Monaco or wherever it was came round he didn't have the money to send her and the only way to get the money was to fell yet another lot of trees but all the trees that were within reasonable distance of transport means of transport had already been felled and all the other trees were too far away such that the cost of transport would virtually eat up the profits on the timber so his business managers made it known that there would be a reward offered for a scheme to transport these tree trunks from the high mountain valleys down to the sawmills usually the only way that people had was in fact to build large dams temporary dams and float all the timber up to the dams and destroy the dams and have the whole banks of crashing down the mountain which use, usually reduced most of the timber to, to use the splinters and create a lot of destruction obviously in this case this wasn't possible and Victor Schauberg submitted a proposal which was instantly dismissed as being absolutely absurd and he got a stiff letter you know enjoining him not to bother people with his ridiculous notions however not long after this young very same young lady came to hunt in his part of the forests and he told her about his scheme and she was so astonished and interested that she persuaded her husband to let him have a go at it on condition that he finance it and should only be reimbursed if it worked and when people heard of the scheme they all laughed I mean the, the man obviously was mad it was going to be a sort of wooden shoot in, a, in an egg shaped section only just about wide enough to take the very large tree trunks uh, that still grew in those places and it was going to go down very shallowly not steeply and it was going to go down in a straight line which was obviously the shortest route from one point to another but in zigzags, meandering down a valley 
I'm sure there's a mammoth. Mammoth. Anyway, he built this thing, and as your guest, it worked to everybody's utter astonishment. In fact, on the day of the trial, you know, all the important people were assembled. The logs that had been floated were up to the chute were uh, sort of medium sized, but one huge, enormous, great trunk found its way amongst them and the uh, uh, log master was trying to get it out of the way but the judges said no 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 try this one and there's an enormous piece of wood kind of just stood on the edge of this and toppled over and just slid all the way down the valley when by all reasonable expectations it should have simply pushed all the water aside due to its enormous mass and just sat uh, in, in this wooden contraption and not moved well, it earned his employer the money, but more than that, it brought into the notice of uh, the, Ost, uh, the relevant ministry, and he started building more of these things all over the place, not because he wanted to deforest the, uh, the Austrian landscape, but because he hoped, naively, that if sufficient profits could be made by a cheap method of transportation, the remaining forests could be saved. Well, he was naive about that. But there still remains, the films were made of this, and there still remains some footage of these things in operation, which are quite extraordinary. There are uh, sh um, openings to bring in fresh, what you called uh, strong water that would be able to support the logs and to drain off the spent, weak, warmed up water uh, that had carried the logs so far. And he had all sorts of contraptions to. Uh, that worked according to the principles that he had uh, begun to observe and from that he went on and began to make more and more discoveries and he was a truly prophetic figure who uh, said some very important things one of them is that he predicted that by the end of the century if man ca carried on as he was doing then and as he has indeed done a bottle of good water would become more expensive than a bottle of wine and we're well on the way towards that uh, the opening of the book actually carries a, a quote which to me does sum up the, the stature of the man and the fact that he wasn't some wild visionary uh, he says people say that I am a fool the hope is that they're right it is not particularly important whether one more or less fool walks about the earth but if I am right and science is wrong then may the Lord God have mercy on mankind so he would have been very happy to have been wrong basically he arrived at the insight that there are fundamentally two possible kinds of movement there is a movement which disperses which is centrifugal which generates heat which dissipates which is the principle of explosion engine and almost all the contraptions that we build and almost without exception all the technology we use and there is and that is the energy that brings about that is based on death on dissipation on dissolution on the loss of cohesion the loss of coherence and there is another movement that is the inverse of that which is more or less in shape the form of a spiral going in and further in further in if you drew a line along a cone goes in then you would have more or less the shape of it and this is a form of movement, movement that concentrates, that strengthens, that vivifies and which is natural to water and which produces the most extraordinary phenomena see when he was working for the ministry he was the object of a great deal of envy uh, from the academics and technicians and so he had attached to him uh, a scientist who however was a true scientist in the sense that he was open enough to look at questions without too much prejudice 
and uh, just find out what the answers really were. So one day they were walking along a stream, and Victor Schalberger, who was deeply put out by this, probably quite sneeringly said, pointing to one of these stones in the shape of, a, of an egg, would the Herr Professor like to tell me whether the water that flows past the stone is warmer before it flows past the stone or after? And the professor said, well, of course, it's warmer after. You have friction and it's gone further under the sunlight and started to draw diagrams and explanation. And Schauberger just cut through this and said, well, let's go and measure it, shall we? And waited in, measured the water before and measured the water after the temperature of the water. And called out, it's 0.4 degrees centi of a degree centigrade colder after the stone. And the professor, who was a, you know, already elderly gentleman, couldn't believe it, took off his trousers and his fine shoes and he waded in, made the measurement, and truly, the water was colder after. Inexplicable. As Schauberger began to trust him, he probably took him round and uh, allowed him to make some of the other observations that he had made. Um, he found that the vivifying force of water was greatest, for instance, in nights of full moon. And one of the observations that is recounted in the book is that he stood by a pool into which fell a stream of water and saw a whole school of fish rise up and dance around in a kind of cycling motion. And then a huge great trout sort of come and sort of push them apart and also began to kind of cycle around. And then coming to the point where the water was dropping into the pool, without seemingly exerting any force with its fins or tail, and just fell up, or was almost pulled up, just catapulted up along the stream into the pool above. And other things, that stones, particularly of this round shape, this egg shape, in conditions where water is most strong, most dense also, has its, most, its greatest carrying power at 4 degrees centigrade and under moonlight, such stones would begin to be carried up and themselves move in this movement which is inherent to water. Well, he went on to predict that if mankind carried on using the destructive forces rather than building on a knowledge of how nature works and he always said man must take nature as his teacher and work as nature works and then everything will be easy but uh, he saw everybody do just the opposite and work against her and, you know, in a destructive and violent fashion and he predicted that uh, more and more illness more and more unwell being more and more poisoning and more and more uh, disasters of every sort would befall people even in the health because the water itself that they drink which is the stuff of life was robbed of its vitality, robbed of those subtle powers that it needs to have to actually nourish us fully and truly. He went on to make also a lot of other, uh, do a lot of work in agriculture and uh, a number of fields, a very remarkable thing. He found, for instance, that the use of uh, um, iron, ferric implements in agriculture is, is a very undesirable thing uh, because the uh, magnetic properties of the iron that remains in the ground has a drying out effect uh, and instead he proposed the use of copper implements in fact set up experiments and, and, and proved the thesis that you can uh, achieve very much higher yields simply through avoiding iron implements and using copper implements uh, and what copper uh, the effect of copper is quite the reverse that it has it helps the earth to bind and hold water and consequently uh, crops grow a good deal better <coughs> he was forced by the Nazis to work for them in fact uh, during the war and was made to work on a project to use the insights that he had into this energy that water has to produce an engine and interestingly enough Rudolf Steiner also predicted that a, 
a form of motion or a form of a kind of engine if one could call it that or it would be very different from the sort of engine that we have today uh, could and would be developed and should be developed um, using vital principles rather than mechanical principles now this Schauberger did what he didn't have is means of controlling the force and according to his testimony the, uh, the contraption actually worked but took off and shattered on the ceiling of the factory where they were working and shortly after the, 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 that the war came to an end uh, the Russian occupation forces came and uh, everything was confiscated the machinery, the tools, the, uh, the notes and shortly thereafter he had a, mi- a visit from uh, American military intelligence and the two officers threatened him and advised him to never again engage in this kind of research which of course he ignored being the sort of man he was and there still are records of experiments that he conducted at a German university in the, I think in the 50s quite clearly demonstrating the validity and the, the, the verifiability of the things that he had to say about the motion of water I mean, this is a very simple experiment they had a sort of egg shaped bowl of water with a drain and they measured how water drains down a straight tube and they put things in the water and they saw that the, the, the water has trouble carrying off sediment and that there's a great deal of friction and when you actually put on a tube as he suggested like a kudu antelope's horn going in a spiral the friction on the side of the uh, tube wall was much reduced and any sediment that was actually in the container was carried off very much more easily um, and of course he had proposed the redirecting of rivers according to this principle many years before he said we're killing all our great rivers and poisoning our water in terms of its life bearing properties by just sticking them into sort of straight sided concrete straight lines where the only effect is that everything silts up because the water doesn't have the strength to carry off all, you know, all that it has washed down from the mountains uh, and it's uh, a, a constant labor just to keep this thing going and meanwhile uh, because you are interfering with the proper functioning of water all the land around sickens and he explained how that works and it's extremely convincing so there I was having read this for three days and uh, I do read it if you wish it's, it's, it really is a remarkable book and so my head was full of this and I was sort of wandering around the house and came to my mother's desk where I saw a large pile of papers this was it was in sort of four different folders at the time and sort of just opened it idly it won't work this time I'm sure and on the page in front of me was something entitled Poem in Memoriam Victor Schauberger so I realized that I had a lot more reading in front of me than I bargained for and started to plow through this stuff it's a typescript and it's the sort of privately published work of the Forschungsstelle für Bioenergie which means the research station for, for bioenergy so I started reading this and it's pretty tough going stuff this not like this biography which you know is uh, better than a thriller really but nevertheless what was in it made me feel that you know, here was something of real and there really was something there I couldn't quite figure out what it was because it was too difficult and I didn't really understand all that much uh, reread some bits of it uh, now I've, I've had to read and reread read what seemed to me to be the key passages of this uh, you know, as I say it's pretty dense stuff but there seem to be some really extraordinary insights in it and they have to do with the fact that intuitively we all know that life is one life is a whole thing not lots of bits and we also know it's somehow intuitively obvious that the enormous variety of life forms 
is somehow connected to this oneness of life. It's the very thing that life is that requires that there should be this proliferation, profusion of different, wonderfully different kinds of living beings. But how? You know, how is life one? And how does that mean that it has to be so diverse? You know, that that's something else. How to understand that? Well, what they have found is that water is the key to this. And water, they found, has what they call nine forms of resonance, which uh, manifest like this when you use a pendulum. Um, and these nine forms of resonance enter into interaction with all energy that bathes the surface of the planet. You have energy that comes in as cosmic radiation from the stars and from our own sun in all different forms as light, electromagnetic radiation and other more subtle forms of energy you have energy that comes from within the earth as heat, as tectonic activity as chemical interaction you have the activity in the atmosphere um, all of that are different forms of energy sound even is a form of energy course and all of that somehow water works with and resonates with interacts with through these nine forms of resonance and sets up states of activity of activeness of vivifyingness within the water molecules and builds up through this interaction these nine patterns of information which are illustrated here that have specific correlation with uh, 16 of the fundamental elements out of which all living beings build their tissues and which correspond to a transformation of the energy with which water has resonated into fields of information into a form that is more complex that has already been transformed and changed. Now this information is then integrated by uh, a quadruple field of four fields that are integrative of all of these states of activity and information and this whole process which is this, this triple process they call the guidance of eco or of the ecosystem of the build up of ecosystems through the formation of auras I, all of this activity builds up the subtle forces which if you like are the guiding power that enables organisms to build up the structure of their tissues and organs as ordered structures in space and to maintain their metabolic activity as dynamic processes in time there is something that guides this and this something is something that completely eludes science as we have it there is no uh, adequate uh, or near adequate approach even to the mystery of life within science because life only deals with the wrong kind of motion with a, with a dispersive disintegrative mechanical forces the thing that actually integrates that is capable of interacting with the forces that come in from the cosmos and transform those yield the subtle forces that enable life to build up the forms of organisms that we know now if you look at this and I know it's quite a mouthful already um, then and think about it then something quite remarkably interesting is being said here because what you have is a picture of the whole of life on earth through the mediation of water and therefore as one with water and there again all the traditions regard water as the key to life and uh, 
I mean, there are many, many ways it's put. One of the most pregnant, powerful ways, in fact, I, that I've come across uh, is in the Quran, where the divine speech says, um, from water have we brought forth every living being. But you have the spirit over the waters in the uh, in Genesis. And the, I mean, you have the primacy of water everywhere. But what you, to come back to this, what you have is an emerging picture, a vision of the whole of life as a as a single functioning entity that is in constant interaction with the energies that enter into the orbit of the earth and that is constantly maintaining the an equilibrium between the availability and the different types and the intensities and so on and so forth and the changes in energy so there's a constant flow equilibrium being maintained between what is there and the capacity of the different life forms to change and use this information to make it available as information for the build up of further complex structures because of course this process of uh, resonance and information is one that goes on in all the tissues of living beings which in any case are largely made up of water as well as in the water that is present in the atmosphere and in, in the soil and in water bodies both underground and on the surface um, and is carried further through the energy exchanges that take place within the metabolic activities of the organism and uh, in the exchanges of bodily fluids and so on and so forth all of this is a whole constant both in the microcosm and in the macrocosm cycle of transformation of energy of build up of information and of and as a yield from that of new of new information as new forms of life new forms of behavior of societies all of these are resonance built upon resonance so to speak um, in fact I mean if you, if you if you look at the smallest parcel of earth each one is different it has particular grasses and microorganisms and animals living in it large animals will have passed over it and uh, left whatever they, they've left or even died there and the processes that go on of transformation of substances which themselves use up and transform the energy that is present all of that is part of the cycle and this cycle in the large picture is constantly adapting and thereby building whole ecosystems and changing them in accordance with the energy potential that is present at any one time and place so that on the one hand you have a picture of life as a whole and of its also its rootedness its interaction with cosmic forces which is again an, an obvious truth and how it mirrors that and transforms these um, but at the same time necessarily produces diversity in the process now that's if you like the basic as I understand it uh, way in which they've the fundamental way in which they've grasped something but from this have come very very many insights and have touched on a wide wide range of fields which is another thing that I find extremely interesting about this you know that it's as, as fecund as, as, as diverse as life itself it's not a sort of narrow one channel type of scientific approach um, I mean there's a lot of work that's gone through this if I, if I show you some of the illustrations that go on in, that they've gotten here uh, for one they've done a lot of uh, purely empirical careful work of testing different substances both for the pendulums and, and, and the effects on different substances of, of uh, different energy fields and so on and so forth um, then they've built up the information here so that's, that's Gernot Grefe this picture of Gernot Grefe testing the waters in Hamburg harbor which unsurprisingly are stone cold dead uh, here's a graph explaining exactly in what way and corresponding to which types of energy stress which types of deficiencies what actually is wrong with it yeah. this is the important thing 
if you're going to do anything about it, you have to understand what is, you know, in detail what is wrong, what is needed. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture, believe it or not, of the evolution of water through different phases and the build-up of information corresponding, in this case, to some of the different elements uh, that I mentioned. Um, but another thing that's very important to them, for instance, is homeopathy. They uh, are absolutely certain that homeopathic processes are completely key to understanding a great deal of the phenomena that they're talking about. That the way that information is passed on, the way that uh, substances are changed, adapted to, the way that energy even is transformed, all of that requires an understanding of homeopathic processes. And in fact, organisms themselves are it's like homeopathic factories that constantly uh, the, uh, the, the body fluids are, fluids are in a state of what do you call it, the shaking up the um, succussion um, and that there are constant exchanges of information going on this is particularly important actually in the humus layer of the earth that um, uh, and another thing that is important in fact are uh, and this is where some of the humus research that Gernon Clayf has done really plays into it are the extremely complex substances that you find in humus, particularly the humic acids, that are very, very complex uh, uh, organic uh, uh, substances with an incredible variety of, of in existence that have very, very pow powerful function in, term of, in terms of uh, energizing living systems uh, strengthening their capacity to retain water and to maintain the resonance without which they can't build up the information which is the basis of their own coherence yeah. um, in fact something very interesting that he told me is, and apparently it's, it's a known fact that water which is uncompressible under all ordinary circumstances unless you use I think that at very, very, very high pressures, you can in fact compress it, but at any kind of thinkable uh, pressures, uh, under thinkable circumstances, water is fully, totally uncompressible. But when it is in a capillary state, you know, as the sap that's rising in a tree, or all the body fluids and the capillaries within our, our bodies, uh, then in fact, water goes down to 90% of its volume. Uh, he didn't go further into it, but if you think about it, of course, since capillary activity is the result of water or of surface tension, yeah, you you can imagine that when you have a large amount of water which suddenly goes off and starts moving due to the activity of the tension, there is actually a contracting uh, activity that goes on, which again links in with a great deal of what Schauberger has to say. And it is, it is very interesting, it's very important, actually, that water that is healthy has a high surface tension. Water that is polluted has a low surface tension. And that's why one of the reasons you put detergents into water is to actually break down the surface tension so you make it more fluid. Uh, and if you make water flow in the flow forms that John Wilkes has, has developed, but which, if you like, follow the principles that Schauberger uh, discovered, uh, then, if you take polluted water with low surface tension, just make it flow down a series of steps in the way that is natural to it. At the bottom, one of the quantitative measurements that you can make is that you will have increased its surface tension. I, water that is healthy has a high surface tension, and just by flowing in the right way, you can make it healthy. Um, so, water that's in a capillary state goes down into this contracted, vivified, active, very active phase. And they have discovered that just by using the capillary powers of water, you can arrive at uh, homeopathic potentization. Yes. In fact, they use this principle. The, the minerals company with whom they work uh, to produce all the substances that I'll talk to you about um, has developed a, a, a way of producing a spun, um, sort of spun fiber from... Um, what do you make pots of, you know, clay, that's it, um, which I gather is aluminium silicate. Um, anyway, whatever. You get these very, very fine fibers, incredibly fine, a bit 
in fineness like hair or or even finer or like glass fiber white very beautiful and they put this into a huge glass tube you know, to stuff it down and then they pour whatever they want to potentize through it and I've tested this out with a number of uh, homeopathic chemists uh, you know people who've tested the substance out you just stand a vessel at the bottom let it go through in, you know and it's heavily capillarized and it's potentized end of story so what happens in the soil? you get an incredibly powerful potentizing action yeah? and the stronger the humus and the humus presence is the stronger the capillary activity and the stronger the dissemination of life information yeah? so you have that going on in bodies you have that going on in the soil you have that going on everywhere and all of that is vital again to understanding how the whole of life works together and how this information is constantly being exchanged between organisms as a constant activity that goes on it's of transformation of energy of uh, trans um, mutation or metamorphosis of substances and of energies another thing that I found really well for me very important is that they that they think art is very important uh, they have developed on the basis of all this and I'll go into it a bit further 28 measures of healing the landscape and healing places and organisms um, but what they've done is they've illustrated these with works of art of artists that they know yeah. and this is unusual to regard all of this as being directly relevant in you know, artistic activity to all of this because it's a form of resonance in fact somewhere earlier on there is a picture of a rather nice um, stage you know as in theatre uh, I wish I could find it let me see it's here somewhere um, right, in fact I hope it's not a dumb page number well, I could oh yes here it is 77, I remember that yeah rather a nice stage and what this says uh, the stage as it uh, um, me as a mediator of information in the sense of uh, vital of life information and you can see that the the artist I mean the, the playwright resonates first of all with life to bring into being this new encapsulation of it and, it and then the way that that is disseminated itself is uh, a process of constant interaction between the artists that perform and the, the audience and that all of this is if you like a, a further stage of resonance and of the build up of information of the transformation of energy uh, and you know of all the processes which result from the being of water and uh, the existence of life this for instance this is nice uh, colors and scents as in smells uh, arise out of cosmic radiations they avoid microwave stress particularly when rocks, rock dust are available to help um, the, this is the, the, the actinobiofilter that's a particular form of humus uh, mimics the respiration of tree bark and as a result uh, poisonous gases, toxic gases are taken up and transmuted and what is given off is carbon dioxide which is of course what bodies do like one of the things I mentioned to you Alan Hall earlier on one of the things that he is very strong on he, he, he's, he builds these reed beds as uh, uh, systems for uh, getting rid of what we call waste and there are plants that do the most extraordinary things that take up 
and transmute or uh, uh, metabolize the most extraordinary ways things like cyanide and the most poisonous substances you see and this is all part of the capacity of life to transmute information substances and energy well here this rather lovely picture the, the, the metabolism of uh, human beings is dependent on healthy water and uh, provisionally humus and stone dusts must replace fully live water which at the moment is unavailable this is one I, I particularly like this, this picture of a cathedral um, I always have difficulty with this word the um, leaf mold cover of the forest and I really see a forest in this um, uh, protects the moisture in the soil from irradiation and from pollution through toxic substances thanks to its capacity of transformation which is exactly what we're talking about and you can imagine if you think about it you have and it's, it's a completely natural process you have the leaves being shed and in, a, in them there are very inc- uh, incredibly varied substances I mean you have the tannins of the, uh, of the oaks and you have these rather acid uh, um, needles of, of, of the, you know, conifers all sorts of very 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 different substances all falling down forming a tapestry of the most diverse substances and activities that result of course yes and so you have this, this layer of intense trans- transformative activity going on which soaks up the energy as light or heat or whatever it is that is there which means that what's underneath which is the moisture retained by the soil is completely protected from it because everything's being, being soaked up and transformed by the activity that's at the top yeah. and it makes complete sense you know, that, you know, to see how it works is the is the thing that's interesting so you know, it goes on like this um, see one of the really important things is, is the practical aspect you know, I mentioned what do you do about it what they found is that particular forms of particular kinds of rocks and in different degrees of what naturally would be weathering high degrees of fineness as dust or as particles or you know, uh, large pieces have also an effect of interaction with energy and each particular kind of rock has a different job to do they do different things and you can identify particular rock substances and mixtures that give a shielding effect against specific form of energy stress now I haven't mentioned energy stress but that's really the important thing uh, that's a big chapter actually I, I should go back to that uh, where you have energy and the um, um, the resonant activity of water the resonant power of water you have the build up of information out of which the possibility of life arises but if you have too much energy and of course we've been liberating energy on a massive scale particularly in the last couple of hundred years then you start getting in excess potentially over what any part of the biosphere is capable of mopping up of using up, of absorbing of transforming of making available as further information to so to speak feed the continuation of evolution yeah? so you begin to get a stress and that stress breaks down the resonant ability of water and you start going down the scale uh, of those five kinds of water that we talked about that the uh, Australian Aborigines know perfectly well about seems to have the five words for it uh, and the water starts dying uh, and not just the water but of course the vitality of all living organisms starts dying back and specific forms of energy stress have specific effects on specific uh, types of information specific types 
uh, on specific um, resonant powers. I mean, it's not kind of haphazard. Um, and where you have this on a large scale, and this is what they warn of, you will get inevitably, because the whole of nature, if you like, is a an organ for finding an equilibrium between the energy that is present and the capacity to use it, you will get sudden adaptations to excess levels of energy. Yes? And these sudden adaptations are of course catastrophic for the organisms that are there that are already weakened and can't cope anyhow. Yeah? And so what do you get? Well, you get the release of built-up tensions through tectonic activity and through sudden temperature gradients and therefore you get uh, violent climatic variations and we've had the forerunners of this of course in the last few years um, what else do you get you get um, the let me get that right let me look it up so I can just check you get a response to particularly the build up of radioactivity through the proliferation uh, massive proliferation of algal blooms because algae have a particular capacity to respond to that kind of stress you have uh, a response to poisonous toxic emanations uh, that come from toxic substances through the proliferation of plant and animal pests. It's very interesting that the, the proteins uh, or prevents plants from being able to, to, to produce these proteins in, in the proper way, which means that you have many more amino acids free in the tissues. Well, of course, the pests who you know, if they find a healthy plant, have to suck out the, 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 uh, the proteins, have to, 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 to uh, break them down. Uh, well, they're very happy, you know, if all this stuff is sort of hanging about in an unbuilt up state. So it really is counterproductive on every possible level. But there you are. Uh, you know, we've been told long enough that we're working against sense. Uh, there is a response to. Uh, excessive electromagnetic uh, stress and uh, disturbances through uh, a multiplication of bacteria and viruses so you have more illness you have uh, the uh, response or use, using up of microwave excesses through uh, an increase in cancerous growth cancer cells uh, there is a um, there are effects on the whole of the immune system there are changes in the bodily fluids as a reaction to uh, constantly increasing ultraviolet stress which is particularly uh, uh, influenced by the ozone hole and so on and so forth and, 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 and you know, you changes of the nervous system through electrical stress uh, and of course that's why my mother couldn't sleep all this electricity you know, it makes her nervous and then you can't sleep if you're nervous can you right? it all ties in with observations that people have made all over the place in different ways with the fact that we've got algal blooms now happening all over the place with the fact that people, you know, we, we've got new kinds of um, uh, flus all the time you know, all this kind of stuff um, I mean we all know about um, and people who've been doing more research like uh, the man I mentioned to you Alan Hall much of this ties in with a great deal that he's already found in his particular way so what they're warning of is that the, the, the continuation of our present way of doing things will lead inevitably to catastrophe to the uh, increased and constant undermining of the ability of organisms to just to maintain themselves and to catastrophic changes uh, in the natural system as a whole through um, uh, through climatic change for instance through earthquakes, tectonic activity and so on and so forth uh, but also there will be uh, uh, they, they, they mention and they're worried about and I'm worried about the changes in the psyche because all of that, you know, how does the resonance in the psyche how, how is, are all those processes affected uh, and when you see that uh, the, the resonance that should be natural to us has already been so far diminished that for very many people all of these things aren't visible at all you know that it's not actually 
a true problem um, or, and also that efforts such as these and many others that are aimed at actually addressing the issue are regarded as being completely loopy mm. at best and dangerous at worst all of that you know, where does that come from where does this lack of connection or resonance to what is in front of us arise so uh, I would say that there is also obviously a, a, a constantly rising danger of the breakdown of the capacity for social interaction yeah? and uh, you know, the increase in violence that we uh, notice as being endemic to our society I mean just needs no additional illustration really so you have all of this now they really started going in 1987 a bit over a year after Chernobyl they were going around doing their experiments measurements using the pendulums to find out and to verify all the things that they always found you know they always got this here and they always got that there and one day they went around and it was all gone nothing left not a single pattern that was coherent there was only chaos all they got from the pendulum was a totally chaotic movement without any coherence whatsoever and they already knew or felt that they knew enough about the importance of all these phenomena that they were scared down to their bones at the disappearance of all underlying information and resonance everywhere they, she showed me a bottle of English Channel water that was sent to her by somebody I know, a very very fine biologist and she sent them a sample of this water and she showed me when I was in Vienna and, uh, we were talking with her she showed me what the pendulum did it's completely chaotic, absolutely nothing and in comparison she showed me a bottle of the water that they treated as a which was a humus extract and the pendulum completely still not any, not, nothing just totally still and the point is that what you have there is a, bo a water body however small it may be that is completely balanced and therefore capable of absorbing and transforming all the energies that come from it the whole spectrum, whatever it is you know, all the radio waves and you know the uh, radio telephones the, the whole lot this was in the, on a hot sunny day there was building work going on next door I mean, it was pretty noisy on the veranda and the water that is in the state of complete strength and health is capable of completely absorbing and working with us and this is what you find and as soon as you have a form of stress the pendulum starts uh, swinging to indicate or indicating which particular resonance is affected which particular form of information is beginning to be lost and of course the swing of the pendulum itself is a help to the organism or to the water to begin to reintegrate uh, that particular information that particular resonance to be able to work with the particular energy that at the moment is a, st is a stress factor um, so that's important because she, Maria particularly treats people and animals and also plants by this method well, again I'll come back to that but in the, in the broader view here they were 1987 and everything had gone and since then they regard themselves as being if you like in a catastrophe situation in a state of collapse and that they have no option but to like strain every sinew to try and do what is required to restore some basic vitality, some basic balance and they now work with uh, well by now several hundreds of people if not thousands on the continent going around putting the various substances around to help counteract this and for instance they claim that the storms that we had uh, here but which also uh, brought a great deal of devastation to Germany I have a friend who has extensive forestries uh, and he showed me showed a group of us what happened there uh, inevitably some of it is uh, monoculture 
and you know whole swathes of it just mown down by these storms well Fesnach and Grefus say that on that these storms abated on the boundaries of those areas that by then they had been able to treat and in general they have developed these 28 measures based on a variety of substances that they've tested in all sorts of different uh, conditions rock dusts and different types of humus and the rock dusts have the particular function of especially shielding against energy stress of different kinds and the humus substances have the function of so to speak kick-starting the processes within water and organisms of resonance the interaction with and the transformation of the energies that we are constantly entering into, entering into contact with and it's in that sense that they say that at the moment healthy water has to be replaced by rock dust and humus to get us back to that uh, and generally where organisms are stressed their own metabolic activity becomes a further stress factor because it is a stressed metabolic activity which produces further energy releases and is, if you like, entropic adds to chaos whereas an organism that is healthy, that is whole and it's very interesting, one of the things that they said was that the most healing thing for a landscape is a t fully resonant human being walking through it because, again they say Plants and animals all again are specialists. They have the capacity to work with particular kinds of energies, particular kinds of substances. They each have specific jobs. The human being is a universal uh, transformatory agent. And also he doesn't need a pendulum, of course, if he's fully resonant. Uh, and interestingly, I mean, I've watched Gernot, he just uses his hands and feels where it's at and then you know, he goes like that. And when he's got it, it goes like this. Um, so that's very interesting. Uh, so the, the the role of human beings is very very critical in all of this. Um, well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I should just go on now with a with a personal story because I'm I'm sort of coming to a close no there's one more thing that I'd like to say um, which struck me very much on reading this and which is yes one of the things that moves me most about it and that makes me feel gosh there you know there are all sorts of things in here um, one day Gernot Gaither was going to some conference or other and he was driving on the motorway in on impulse, just veered off, drove up into the hills, and arrived at a place called Maria Schutz, um, Mary's protection, or protected by Mary, however. Schutz is protection, Maria. Maria Schutz. And I can't remember the exact details but he stopped off and went into the church Maria Schutz devoted to Mary and started looking for the water and I can't remember whether it was actually in the church or just behind the church but there was a spring there was water so he tested it by the methods and could not believe what he got here was the impossible here was water that was totally alive fully, totally resonant in an age when as far as they were concerned it was impossible such a thing no longer existed under the protection of Mary's mantle there was life so that to me meant a great deal because I think Mary is very important in our time and I think it's important that they included this story in this document actually mentioning that uh, Gernot in fact is a Protestant he's originally German and, German and you know, they don't go in for this kind of thing very much as Protestants but there you are, this is what happened 
this holy well is the one that is if you like the point of departure for work that they've now done to revitalize a whole host of wells that are now fully resonant in Austria springs and wells uh, they've gone as far as Turkey to pour uh, humus extracts and potentized humus extracts into uh, I think the Euphrates particularly because they were extremely worried about the effects of the burning oil wells in Kuwait because of course oil is another highly potent highly resonant organic substance which was being blown up into the atmosphere and they're interacting in a negative way with all the excess energy you know, from down from the satellites to everything that we're doing down here and this was a very very significant stress factor which they went down there to try and help counteract so they really see that see themselves as having the means and therefore being on a mission to to do a healing that is desperately urgent now I went to them again this meeting was very short in August um, in November last year and that was interesting I took the train and told me where to go and they live as I said in the outskirts of Vienna or a bit outside Vienna really but in pretty well the most unattractive part of Austria you could imagine you know, Austria is a, it's a picture book country but this part is the Danube plain which runs down to the Hungarian Pusta and uh, because it's flat and it's an alluvial plain has a lot of very intensive agriculture on it and some small strip intensive forestry but also quite a bit of industry and uh, to, to cap it all has the mineral oil deposits so they have oil wells and refineries stood about in the place so it's not particularly nice and so I was, I was sitting in the train looking out on this feeling slightly surprised that that's where they'd be and Maria picked me up at the railway station very vivacious lively woman and took me to their home and I walked in and I was somewhere else I was one of these deep silences in the place and that feeling of calm that you get in very strong places you know, some cathedrals have it some haven't anymore but some have or high up in the mountains in, in, in deep in the woods caves there are places that have this strong strong silence it's so strong you can hear it and it was like that in that house you know if you looked through the window it was very hard to believe that that's where you were so that was really quite a stunning thing to experience going in there they showed me you know their bit of land they've got a strip of forest same sorts of conifers as everybody else Schwarzfurven they're called and uh, normally all you get underneath these nowadays particularly in that place is just a thick layer of dead needles because these trees that should shed their needles every seven years by now shed them every one, two or in best three years because they're so stressed out everything's sick really in our Western European countries and most of the world but there admittedly they've been working on this place for a long time uh, it wasn't like that I mean, the, the place was covered in thick undergrowth grasses, little oak trees springing up, I mean every possible sort of thing growing this was in November, I mean you know it wasn't a flower or anything but you could see you know, it was a kind of jungle <laughs> you know, I mean only two foot high but nevertheless and you could also see because their neighbors had uh, forbidden them to do anything in their part uh, you could see the sort of greenness traveling out into the neighboring bits of forest and then petering out further away and, you know down there a few hundred yards away it was all brown again yeah, so that was you know pretty uh, concrete stuff but for me even more strong or more personal 
she treated me by this pendulum treatment she said look I, I follow the pendulum I, you, you have to be very clear you just find out what's needed and the pendulum you know and so she doused me basically um, and, uh, and the pendulum was really going around at the rate of knots you know I mean, a bit too much for her so like, so she was holding it away and you know, she'd go up here or where does it need to be next you know like that uh, and they use a variety of substances you know, I had to hold something that looked like iron filings, but I don't think it was iron, it was something else. You know, she had a whole tray of these, you know, to find out which one I should hold. And again, because each substance does a particular mediating job, so obviously if there was a deficiency, I could be helped by... Anyway, so there she was doing this, and then she also, she also uses Bach flower remedies. And then she, she emphasized, look, I've not been trained, I don't, I don't understand this in that way, but they're very potent important remedies and I use them and I use the pendulum to tell me which and where and it took her quite a while to find out where because there was a spot that she'd never uh, had to uh, you know, find before it was the crown of the head in my case just one drop of something uh, and uh, yeah, as I say it took her a while um, this took in I mean you know she, she, she lavished rather a lot of time on me about half to three quarters of an hour I think perhaps and then I felt a bit peculiar for two days I felt basically as though I was walking through mud right up to, right up to here sort of really hard work moving about and my mother who does know me very well remarked on the fact that I was looking peculiar and pasty when I got home at night but when the two days were up um, I have to say up until then I'd been going to a variety of therapists because uh, I'd I had the feeling that I just didn't have the vitality I ought to have at my age you know, I just didn't have the strength to do what I you know to just get on with things you know, a day at work and I'd be out useless for anything else wouldn't be talking to you and that really changed after that my vitality level jumped and you know, my wife verified that you know, quite clearly uh, it was different and although that was the beginning of the process I mean it really got one hell of a kick at that point and it's still going on I'm still seeing a number of different people to help me along with it and one of the things that they say is of course that the substances that they give you are particularly potent at enhancing the effect of any therapy even ordinary medical whatever it is because it just enables your body to cope and to use up and to, to, to respond to whatever it is whether it's substances, energies whatever uh, in the right way so that for me was obviously quite, quite good useful evidence uh, it also showed me picture of their work in, pictures of their work in Spain now they're not so easy to see but they started in the Almeria which was at one time the breadbasket of Spain which is now turning to desert not a lot growing on it and there he is sort of putting the materials in various places specifically you know, specific places that have been determined by the use of the pendulum and uh, they started this work in 1989 and what they write although admittedly I must say that you know, the pictures it's not so easy to see you can see that it is pretty desert like here um, but what they say is that the desert landscape which was only covered with uh, dry land bushes has greened the vegetation of the dry valleys begins to recover the, uh, the slopes and gives the pioneer grasses the necessary protection to begin the humification processes that lead to water retention ability in June 1992 the vegetation has made progresses, progress and has further enhanced the water retaining powers of the landscape several days still after 
severe rainfalls brooks that are normally running that are normally dry are still running deep in water so you know the humus has built up and the water retaining power of the land is built up so that the water is released more slowly over several days unlike what's happened in France in areas that really shouldn't be experiencing this at all uh, you know where the soil is is dying and hence isn't capable of retaining the water not only do you get that but because of the change in vegetation cover the, the hills now attract a greater variety of animals of course um, another thing they work with is the dome 16 sided dome uh, corresponding again to these 16 elements it's the, some of the that correspond again to phases of the evolution of, of water uh, they use it for composting processes and sort of have special compost produced them. they also use it to treat sickness uh, actually work with people who are ill in there uh, and very interesting I mean uh, Gernot Grefe told me they've measured the speed of propagation of information for instance particularly in water is very steady if you pour these highly resonant substances into, into a, a lake then you can have somebody with a pendulum you know at various intervals waiting to get the effect and it travels at 68 kilometers an hour through sweet water absolutely steady always the same speed you know, at the appropriate time you know, pendulum starts swinging you, you, you've got the effect very much more slow interestingly in salt water if you do it in sea water it travels at 11 kilometers per hour does it go on indefinitely so if you put some in the, the channel which you end up in the Pacific can I come back to that no. because that is interesting I don't think it goes on absolutely indefinitely no mm -hmm. uh, in fact it, I, I know it doesn't because obviously the stress levels that it encounters uh, begin to uh, be greater than the healing capacity that, mm. that is present and you have to do the work in the spot mm. as required but I'll come back to that because there was an interesting experience the last time I went there but what they found in the domes they had five of these domes as so to speak landscape healing stations dotted around Europe, uh, dotted around Austria and they found that if you do something in a dome then somebody else in another dome no matter how far away can pick it up instantaneously it doesn't take any time to travel you, you get a resonance through the shape this is, another reason, this is one of the reasons why they feel that Europe is extremely important because this kind of work with structures that were erected through sciences that had to do with resonance of one kind or another with a deep understanding uh, have this work has been going on for a very long time uh, in Europe particularly and therefore Europe is a particularly important continent in terms of doing this healing work uh, uh, in other words it's already more energized than yes. yeah. in many ways yes yeah. um, will any day do uh, like uh, any day on top of the building that wasn't designed for that purpose. well again I would suspect that what you would find is that each shape and each variation has a special effect mm. yeah? and what they are trying to do is to find those things which are the most general and that's why they, they work with these basalt pendulums they, they've done the tests uh, with metal and with glass and with wood and all sorts of stone and they use these I mean this is obviously they have all different shapes uh, there's bits of rock uh, they use these basalt pendulums uh, because they are what they call generalists they respond in a very even handed way right across the spectrum of phenomena they're looking for uh, and he doesn't particularly have a scientific explanation I talked with Kenneth Krefer about this last time I was there and he said I don't know why one reason could be that being a depth rock uh, they have a high proportion of all the trace elements in them so again you know, in that sense they would respond in a in a very even way to everything and then he said it's also interesting that it's got magnetite in it and magnetite is the one single ferric substance which retains its magnetic properties when it's oxidized when it's rusted you know, if, you, if you rust a piece of iron it can't hold the magnetic field it's gone but magnetite can 
and there's quite a lot of it in this and so he thinks that when the pendulum starts swinging um, you, you, you may get um, you know, it, it swings through interaction with your own field, energy field and so on but then you may get a simple induction effect you know, an electrical magnetic effect that you have a field built up through movement which is basically what electric motors and all that do um, so you know, that may be another reason why they're quite good to use and you get a helping hand uh, um, oh yes they've, they've done this, this there's a little there's a well a little water company in Austria where they actually agreed to have them do this work do the hum- put the human substances in set about the place the different rock dusts to shield the place but they also did unpaid a lot of work in the catchment area for this well you know, where the water is collected in, in the landscape and it says here the um, nitrate levels dropped immediately upon the completion of those measures so again the water and the whole natural system is capable of actually coping with everything that was there in a revitalized way um, now on this water this, 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 this water uh, propagation question I'm coming to a close now um, but this is, this is rather interesting um, after November I got some of these materials I, I talked with Maria about actually Maria it's very interesting okay her name is Mary but her second name Felsenreich means the kingdom of the rocks yeah. or rich in rocks but I think it's more like kingdom kingdom of the rocks anyway uh, so we worked out some of the things that would need to be done first in Cheltenham so with some friends of mine we, we went and did the things that had to be done and then I went to see them again sometime in early spring and I'm quite sure that Gernot didn't know any of the details of this uh, uh, and I'm sure he had no clue where Cheltenham was anyway but what he had done is that he'd gone to uh, uh, pretty close to the source of the Rhine and poured down a very large quantity <coughs> of this potentized humus water and uh, he'd spent actually whole nights staying up with it following it on the map on the one hand and actually interacting with it so the importance of the human of the human being and of consciousness because he was measuring as it was going along what its level of vitality was whether it was still fully effective or whether it was being stressed by whatever it encountered and various places it was and he found that he could actually help, so to speak, its passage just the same way that Marie, I suppose, had helped me by dowsing me uh, in a similar way by being with it to maintain its resonance all the way down into the North Sea and then he started, I mean, to, to his surprise, the effect went on you know, it travelled on didn't just dissipate this is by map dowsing, it's more yes, like by, by map dowsing not by actually taking samples no, not by some no. No, just following by map housing uh, and he found that it carried on out of the mouth of the Rhine and to surprise it started going up the Thames and when I was there it had already gone some of the way up and he took out an atlas and said, oh, it's here and then he followed it further up as uh, you know, they wore on and he didn't follow the Thames he took the turn where the Windrush comes into the Thames and followed up the Windrush now the fact is that where it stopped which wasn't quite near the source is just about the closest place you can get to Cheltenham by way of water mm-hmm. by way of a stream and I'm quite sure that he wasn't aware I mean, you know, of, of, the, of the things that we sort of concocted with Maria because a lot of the time he wasn't there anyway and they're both extremely busy with you know uh, all sorts of experiments 
so you know, I thought that was extremely interesting that you know, the one place in England where something had actually done, been done the connection was established one thing that she she has written this is Maria about England because I asked her about England and generally she feels or they both feel that uh, in Central and Western Europe two of the areas that really do need work uh, urgently are former Eastern Germany and England who are both presumably in a bad way Eastern Germany because of what's been going on there and England because it suffered industrialization and deforestation earlier than most other European countries, of course. And here's what she says. There's something, a short paragraph entitled The British Isles and their soil water system in the atomic age. The soils of the British Isles are characterized by a special feature which is not uh, cognizable or verifiable by the analytical method. This is a particularly high resonant capacity which probably arose through special uh, developments of the vegetation at a time when the islands were not yet inhabited by humans at that time waters with very significant information capacities must have been washed down to the seas remains of this wealth of individuality in particular watercourses are only present where the soils have been protected from heavy uh, poisoning, toxification through a consistent humus based management such unpolluted topsoils are um, uh, particularly suitable as starting points for networking so if the work is going to be done in England the way to spread the information, the effects of this is particularly by also working with people who are working organically especially in those areas where there is a tradition of it where uh, chemical uh, agriculture has, has been avoided in general and uh, that's what's meant by networking, is it? Yeah. Uh, not general networking, but rather the networking with particular information. Well, uh, I would say that what is meant by that is a very holistic networking, because what is then built up mm. is the resonant information, mm. which, uh, and here I come to a uh, 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 sort of closing but personal note, uh, which has to do also, with very mu- which is very much involved with the capacity of human beings to actually interact with one another mm. and to uh, empathize with nature uh, see at the end of it all I have to say there are things in here that I don't necessarily agree with in here you know, all this writing uh, these are two people who clearly have discovered something very important and uh, I believe that it often does happen that people who have made an enormously important discovery start if you like explaining everything by it and uh, introducing it if you like as a direct explanation even where it may not be suitable in that way now I would not like to say that I know whether they do or they don't but there are certain things that they say that I don't feel that on the basis of what my understanding is and what I believe I would go along with but and I I want to say that very clearly because I'm not sort of uh, here a a kind of propagandist for them or certainly don't want anybody to to feel that uh, the the idea is to take it on lock, stock and barrel Uh, probably wouldn't anyhow but having said that what I do feel is that there is something here that is potentially so important that if even only a tenth of it is true one can't afford not to not to do it Um, and that's why I've um, sort of set out to see whether there are other people who are interested and 
unfortunately there are uh, and from this you know, has come in a very short time uh, well the Life Springs Initiative a very great deal of interest and now uh, they have been invited over to come and give these seminars uh, next week two three day seminars to be trained in their methods of identification diagnosis and healing and really it's a matter of actually finding out through doing it and making up our own minds you know at the end of the day it's experience that will count and what's very gratifying is that there are people from all sorts of different fields who are coming people who work scientifically people who do a lot of water research people who do a lot of work with people uh, either as healers or you know in different uh, therapeutic disciplines as uh, um, people who uh, look at uh, food and diet and all sorts of different people with different inputs and experience and I think that's very important this work what it really is probably only this variety of approaches that hopefully will be brought to it will tell us what it really is my own uh, motivation so to speak in this is that um, or in fact where I'm coming from why, why this grounds me uh, is that it's very clear that the world has to change and that in fact the old world is dying and yet it's very hard to see how the new world that needs to come can and will arise and there are great difficulties there's enormous resistance and there's an enormous amount of negative and destructive activity going on even in ourselves never mind in a lot of other people how can the change come about? How can that be helped? And when I came across this, it immediately reminded me of another thing that uh, Steiner said, Rudolf Steiner said, when he uh, gave the indications for biodynamic agriculture. Very interesting. He said uh, to Günther Wachsmuth that um, the food that people eat nowadays, and this was, you know, in the early 20s, is of such poor quality that it does not contain the subtle forces that people require in order to be able to do the spiritual work which is our work it isn't there, there isn't the whatever is needed to transform in their own metabolism out of which the more subtle energies of consciousness and awakeness and conscience and all of that uh, out of which those so to speak are lifted and it's very much the same here if this is even partially what it appears to be if one can heal the landscape bring back resonance in an area where people live give perhaps just that additional second to somebody when they're under pressure to think well do I have to or whatever it is that you know, it might make a difference and just give them the time to breathe and take thought and perhaps also the strength to follow the inner feelings that we all have and that get followed all too little you know, if something can be done just to facilitate what at the end of the day has to be done within each individual uh, then that would be of tremendous benefit and uh, it is really to find out whether it can be done that I have got involved with this work so there you are